Testing, testing. One, two. Welcome back to the Rick Shields Golf Show podcast, everybody. Episode 155. Sorry about last week. I was off. My bad. But we're back. Myself, Rick. Guy, co-host. Hello. How are you? Yeah, good. Um, you had a little holiday as well, didn't you? I had you? a little break to um, Mottram Hall Spa. Nice. It, yeah, okay, it wasn't bad. There was <laughs> there was some feedback given upon leaving. I'm not someone that complains, so if anyone... This isn't... This, this is like the anti-sponsorship of a podcast. This is, this is if I don't... Yeah, I said to the woman, I checked out, so if you don't give me all my money back now, I'm going to roast you on uh, Rick Shields Golf Show podcast. She went, you're not. And I went, I will. She went, you won't do that. You've not got the guts. I went, watch me. So here I am. No, it was a n- nice day. We filmed there quite recently with Tubes and Ange, didn't we? Oh, we yeah. played golf, and the golf course was decent. And you know what? The, the hotel was nice, and it was a good stay overall. It was a nice 7 out of 10. Uh, but there was a few things I wasn't happy with. Little things, but they you, sorted it. They rectified it. You stand, the thing is with you, yep. okay, and I get, I see it. <laughs> You're spoiled. I am. I'm a spoiled brat. Old course hotel. Yes. Spoils you. Yeah. Doesn't it? It does. <laughs> and, I, and I walk in the old course hotel. I don't even have any respect for it now. I'm not used to it. I just walk in, chuck my shoes on the side. You make yourself, they have your slippers at the front door. They do. Waiting for you. And if my if my steak doesn't come out exactly how I like it, and I like it well done, so I'm not going to get roasted in the comments. I like a steak well done. If it's not well done, I kick off. You know what, though? What's interesting, when we've been out for steaks or food, and you've said that, a lot of the time the waiter's like, no, it's fine. Like, they don't seem like they're that bothered, but I think a, a real meat connoisseur, oh, if that's the thing. There'll be people now watching, seething. I've had this before. We spoke about it once some, somewhere else, but I'm honest to God, I, I'm a fussy eater. Hold my hands up, hold my hands up. But with steak, I've truthfully, truthfully tried it in much uh, lesser done varieties <laughs> because whenever I order steak and steak and I get it kind of well done, I can see them win. Some, sometimes they don't, sometimes they <laughs> win. Yeah, because they don't uh, want to go in and tell the chef. Yeah, the chef that's goes, what? It is. what? How dare he? Is that that Charnock? Yeah, exactly. Does Charnock want it charred? Yeah. Well, I, I back in the day in a in a in a another life, I used to be a chef. Oh, wow, I don't think I knew this. A chef or a pot uh, cleaner? I'd like to call myself a microwave technician. Now, nah, oh, nice. But I mean, I started from the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm here. I was I was a a cleaner of pots. Yeah. With my first job, sixteen I year old. I can't, I, I've got two visions with you cleaning pots. I can I either think you were really really thorough and good or horrendous. Horrendous. No, dog, yeah. Terrible. Of course it was. It, I was I was always the last to leave the kitchen, like way later than I should have done. Is that not a good thing though? Last to leave training, like a footballer. It was always the person, <laughs> last to leave training. I wasn't practising cleaning <laughs> plates. <laughs> it's because me, I, I was, I wanted to be in with the banter of the chefs. Of course you did. Okay. So that meant I wasn't doing my job. Mm-hmm. So that meant when everyone else left at like 10, yeah. I'd still be there with like piles of plates. Yeah. Do you know as well, it's the first, <laughs> It's when I, as I was cleaning plates, pot wash, it was the first time I clocked eyes on my now wife. Wow. So she was a waitress. I was a little old pot wash. Yeah. And uh, it's where we first clocked eyes. I mean, Sparks didn't fly then. No, I can imagine. A few years she looked, later. She, I bet she looked down on you, didn't she? She's a pot washer. <laughs> a few years later when I told her I'm a Mars bar salesman now. Wow. That's what really got it going. But uh, yeah, and then I moved up to starter chef. Nice. Salad, stir, like uh, mixed grills and this, that, and the other. not mixed grills, ultimate combo. Wow. And then I went into mains. You actually did mains? Yeah. Oh my gosh. What What was the most um, kind of like hard to do main that you did? Were you, would you get... Um, <laughs> none of them were that hard. Lasagna in the microwave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, what, which button do we press for the lasagna again? It's is start, it, Rick. Is it two or three? <laughs> It does, do we give them a, a lasagna 30 seconds or 60? <laughs> uh, but we used to do steaks, and and I say steaks, this was a very uh, mediocre restaurant. <laughs> but I can't downplay it because it's, again, where we first I first met my wife um, and my best man, and inevitably enough, he was he was one of the chefs. And uh, we'd sometimes get some orders that were blue. Wow. And how long does that go on the uh, the pan for? I don't even think it went on the pan. <laughs> think it just, we just kind of put it over the top of the griddle. I went, that'll do. It's warm, stick it out. But yeah, it was uh, good times. Anyway, you learn a little bit, something new about me every day. Please comment down below how you like your steak cooked. <laughs> That's what it's resulted. This is what's resulted. We've got nothing to talk about today. So we've literally we have scraped, got, we've got got loads scraped of stuff the barrel. To talk about we have. Because at the moment, golf, I don't know where to start with this. Whether it's this week is going to be probably one of my toughest weeks of my life, I think. Go on. There's a video that's potentially coming out on Friday. Oh, wow. Okay. And Are I we say, talking about this? I say potentially. Well, 
this is the first time. Okay, it's gonna. Ha- yeah, I think. We, uh, wow. If so people, if people have watched Gavin and Stacey, you know that awkward conversation that oh, what the the uh, camping trip, yeah. or whatever the shit fishing <laughs> trip. Yeah. It's like you and me about this this break seventy five that's coming out. We're yeah, like, let's not talk about it. Um, I'm sure most people now listening have watched the previous break seventy five, mm-hmm. which which now in the grand scheme of things is light work. I'm not even that worried that you beat me by five. Oh yeah, now okay. But but just on that though, that wasn't because I beat you. Although I did, that was because you didn't have a great day and I played really well. He did play well nicely. Played nice. I don't think if you've seen the new um, Wimslow break seventy five. You drove the ball as good as I've ever, 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 ever seen you drive the ball. And I missed ball. in the right places. I did yeah. miss a few drives, but missed the right side. That's a big thing. You missed thing. on the right side. Exactly. Well, Literally yeah. on the right side, which on those holes was the correct side yeah. to miss on. Um, you end up shooting almost level par. Yeah. I feel like it's level par and a half. I've seen a few people 72.5 and yeah. we'll give you. Yeah, you know what? I'm actually, this isn't like me, but I've, I've actually had a bit of a brainwave. I saw a couple of comments and a few people have texted me who watched the video saying, I can't believe you missed that putt on the last. It would have been level par if he'd have held that putt. And I'm normally that exact golfer who goes into the clubhouse, everyone goes, what did you shoot? And I'm like, well, I Let shot 85, but if I hadn't have done this, I hadn't have done that, I hadn't have done that, I hadn't have done that, I would have shot level par. And it's just stupid, in it? But truthfully, with that putt when it missed, yeah, a little bit disheartened, it should hold a three-foot putt or whatever it was, maybe even less, two-and-a-half-foot putt. But I also hold a lot of good yeah. putts. And if you put me back there now today and gave him that whole putt on 18 as a hole, I probably would do it. But if you then said, right, but go back and hold that putt, that putt, that putt, and that putt, there's a good chance I wouldn't yeah. hold any of them. You're up and down on 16 was spectacular. Yeah. And you're up and down on 15 was pretty good. Yeah. Because that was a tough yeah, putt. It was. Um, you know what, though? I think on the last, there, there would have been two things that would have made it worse. I think if you were level par and that putt was for one under. That would have been, yeah. I think that would have hurt you more. It would have. Definitely. And you know what? It was your own fault. Your third shot was too good. It was, wasn't it? Wasn't it? It was so good. Why did you do it? Why did you put it too Six close? Six foot would have been fine. Six foot or, or an inch. Yeah. You left, your, like, you put yourself two foot away. I know. It's an awful, yeah, you misjudged that badly. The only, <laughs> yeah, I know. The, the, the only thing got missing that putt is obviously it's frustrating, but it was one of those days where everything went well for me, which happens very rarely in golf, as everybody listening and watching knows. It's so hard. It's so rare that happens. And I made up to shoot one over par, but level par would have just been so clean, wouldn't it? Just nice level par, but... It is what it is. Your game's trending in the right direction, unlike somebody else sat around this table. Uh, Look, Wilmsley weren't bad. What was that actual <coughs> score? 77, that, I think. That's not horrendous. It was weird, It was weird though, because I, I never felt like I should have been shooting a good score. And, and many times I was like, I'm actually doing all right here. It was, the, it was the shot over the green on 12 that just killed me off. Yeah, lost me you know that. what? I saw a, a comment on that one, and I, and I kind of think I might agree with it to some some degree. I think we won. How far away were you on that hole? One twenty seven. You one twenty seven when you hit a wedge out the rough, and it went miles past. But I bet it was quite a flyer that you probably mm. didn't quite, and it was wet as well, yeah, it and it didn't deserve to go that far. It was a strange golf shot that, but I bet you, if you went back and actually reassessed that situation, I bet you would think actually. You know what frustrated me most about that shot? In almost every other situation, I'd have taken my gat wedge, okay, mm-hmm. and I'd have hit it full and come up short. Yeah, and you went to go sensible. And I went, well, let's take one extra club. Yeah. I'm going to hit this really easy. I did like what felt like a half swing, and I thought that looks money. I was like, how the hell's that gone 30 I, I, yards big? I think that's added to it. I think the fact it went easier with lower loft has been lower spin, and then it's a flyer as well with wet grass. I actually think it only probably pitched 10 yards long. I know, and it was an and exaggeration. It hit the down slope, but it, that, that not the wind out my sails. But, but question for you, though, that round of yours wasn't bad. There's was a few hiccups like that, exactly. But I don't know if I said exactly then. Um, but um, do you think, even though you want me to, to play well, obviously I want you to play well, if I'd have shot like 85, which I can comfortably do, and you'd have shot 5 over, your 5 over wouldn't have felt as bad. Do you think because I played well, you could see the course was there to score? Yeah, I think any time you're playing with golfers, I, th- I think any time I go out and play, I, w- I probably want to shoot the best score in the group, to of be honest course, with you. Yeah. So apart from like when I'm going out with some of these tour players. So I think knowing that the score, I think that course was very scorable. Yeah. It really was. And, you know, it just frustrated me that I was like, I couldn't get it going. I couldn't, like, make it work. But um, one more thing I've got in your defence as well here. I saw there was quite a couple of comments with people saying, oh, why do you both, and certainly you, why try and shape every shot? And actually, there's a quite a simple answer to that, I think, and you might elaborate, you might even disagree. But 
to hit a straight golf shot is very, very difficult because you'd have to have typically, obviously, a, a zero path and a zero club face. And a centre strike. And a centre strike. Therefore, the golf ball goes straight. Most golfers have a path that is a certain direction on most of the shots, whether it be into out or out to in. And there's certainly a, um, a face pattern that's consistent and a strike pattern that's somewhat consistent. You know, even if you're a yeah. bad golfer or a high handicap golfer, you probably strike the golf club somewhere consistently on the face or a bit of spread, obviously, but typically a certain area, heely or toey. So when I stand over a shot, I know that I'm at the minute trying to hit across the golf ball and be a bit fady. So that's easier to envision than trying to hit a straight golf shot. And I also know that if I don't quite pull the fade off, I'm going to probably see it either over fade with a driver or blocky, or I may sometimes pull it a little bit, which I kind of know that. If I'm trying to hit a straight golf shot, I don't know, anything could happen. It could go 20 yards left, 20 yards right. Yeah. They could, you could shape it still. Yeah. Straight shot is the hardest shot in so the world hard. to hit. I remember when, it, when I was coaching full time and you get guys coming in going, I just want to hit it straight. And you'd almost have to recalibrate their expectations and go, I don't, not even the best players in the world hit no. it straight. Well, there's two things. The straight in terms of the golf ball literally traveling straight or the straight in terms of where it finishes up to your target line, which you could, if it's, if a ball finishes on the hole, in the hole, then it's a, in theory it's got the, yeah. but it might not have been straight in its flight, right, if that exactly. makes sense. Yeah, I feel like if you've got a, if you've got a pattern that you can play with, so for example, you playing that with the driver, I didn't feel like you were going to miss the ball left with your driver. Yeah, exactly. So it, you can allow for that. Yeah. And similar to me, I was trying to hit these big cuts from my driver because I thought, well, if I try and hit it cut, I'm not going to hit it hit this left. Mm. And I don't think I missed a single drive to the left. Um, so yeah, anyway, I think straight is, well, straight is the hardest because also you've not only got path, face, sentence of strike, that's just presuming you're on a flat, flat ground condition and not even tee boxes are full, are absolutely perfectly flat. So hitting a straight shot is very, very difficult. Um, so we're coming on to the Belfry this week. So Fridays, is it potentially Fridays? We're going to use the word potentially at the moment. Um, there's a round of golf that, at the moment, I don't want to release the video. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and I think probably after maybe 11 holes, I had it in my head, this video has never seen the light of day. And when we finished the round of golf, you said twice, that's not going out. And I, and the camera, my camera guys, Harry and Timmy were there, they still kept recording me mm -hmm. after I told them. <laughs> 10 times after I threatened sacking them both of them then you started begging film. <laughs> he went from crying to shouting to begging so at first he got upset and a little tear came out <laughs> then he said carry on filming you sacked and then you went please 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 stop filming me so it's it's been recorded <laughs> somehow my of all my attempts to lose the SD cards and to burn the footage it's still present a great the footage as well by the way it's so clear Harry and Harry and Tim have backed it up several times, so it's it's I can't get rid of it. And at the moment, Harry started to edit it. Yeah, as much as I've told, as much as he doesn't <laughs> actually work here anymore, <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what he's doing. Um, so at the moment, that video is being edited, and I am yet to decide whether it'll ever see the light of day. It still. may end up on the dark web. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, well, we're going to so, give a little bit of backstory to this. I don't, the, the people, I'm sure people can probably guess. <laughs> There's not. It didn't quite go to plan, ladies and gentlemen. No. Just in case you're uh, you're presuming or wondering. Yeah, it was. Well, first things first. Genuinely, the Belfry was great. We went down there. We spent the day there looking at some new product that's coming out next year, which will meant well. That was we'll the day after. Actually, minute, we'll yeah. come on to in a bit. We can't say too much on that. Um, but what's that on your computer then? I was looking, I was reading comments from the previous Break 75, so I was trying to find some funny ones. Oh, right, okay. And it just started playing. Um, and then we, the day before this meeting, though, we played the golf course, and it was in great condition. The Belfry is really good, I, isn't it? I love the Belfry. Yeah, I do. Whereas before I was against Mottram Hall, I'm very pro Belfry. <laughs> So if the Belfry want to offer me a spa break as compensation for a bad experience at Mottram Hall, I'm here. I feel like it'd be good there as well. It, it would be really good. Really relaxing. You take your partner, they can eat some food and drink. Luxury hotel, several bars. Sam's Bar, great burgers, great onion rings. Well, let, should we... Let, well, part of the golf... For the, <laughs> right, for the golf, golf is bloody nothing, right? right? Forget the golf, okay? Whether it'll come out or not, who knows? I think it, yeah, it'll Friday, be a big Friday one. at four, get ready to refresh your computer because you might see me you might never see me again after that video yeah you might i might lose all we are worried about rick <laughs> all credibility um i've been banned from driving on friday no but no just do a note on this if we do release it which we may do let's be honest but if we do 
I think there's testament to yourself because I'm going to say this now in front of everybody listening. Obviously, you don't know I'm going to say this, but you could easily, easily, easily fake these videos. You could. You can't fake your first tee shot because a lot of people are normally watching, or certainly men. We've tried. I'm yeah. joking, I'm joking. You can't fake your 18th, you put on the 18th because again, people sometimes watch. And very rarely, you know, the people on the golf course who might come over and say hello. But there's so many chances on the golf course. Every single break 75 were, I mean, and the bother, my, my scores are relevant, but for your score, you could literally hit out of bounds and go, I'm going to hit that again. The famous one was at Conway, par three. You went, oh, yeah. <laughs> shank lost, shank lost, come off with a nine and a par three. We could have edited that so easily so you only saw the the final tee shot, which would have actually given you a five or whatever it would have given you. And, what, so, and one of our previous editors wouldn't do that for me, so no, he, he no longer now works he's gone. here. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm um, joking. But we want to keep these videos real, and some days you're going to play bad golf, some days you're going to play okay golf, some days you're going to play great golf, and that is golf. And I think I one think- thing I do want to lastly on this, one thing I do want to say as well, though, is on this. The golf courses we play aren't normally easy, let's be honest. We play off often as far back a tease as we can. They sometimes speed up the greens because they know you're going to film in there. <laughs> I definitely think the Belfry put the pins the in. The greens the, were the, rapid. The, the, the hardest positions ever. They, they were. Last week. So that's just a note that, you know, it is real what you see. And I think that's something that a lot of people do. You might get some idiot comments, which you always will. And you can't not get that with the amount of views the videos are getting. But it is difficult. So, yeah. Friday for... <laughs> We'll see, see what happens. You'll go on Rick's channel on Friday. It'll be a tumbleweed. There'll be no video. He'll just be saying, channel no longer exists. Yeah. <laughs> Channel's gone. Um, but apart from the golf, we actually had a really good time at the Belfry. We really did have a good time at the Belfry. We, we got a bit smashed up. We did, yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we had a fight. <laughs> we got black eyes. I said, I'm not releasing that video. And you went, you are. I, yeah. played, I played good. I'm like, no. Um, yeah, so after... The golf, we went into the bar. We did. Really nice bar. So good. We went for a swift one. Swift one, swift half after the game of golf. Five beers deep wow. we had at the bar. Yeah. Just we at did. the bar. I sat, I sat on the vodka. <laughs> <laughs> I got, what was that? Was I on Guinness? You are on Guinness, and then the guy came over, an Irish, Irish guy, guy, who was a fan of the channel, so he bought you a drink, bought me a drink. You, knew, you actually nearly offended him. I thought he was from Northern Ireland, and he was from Republic of Ireland, but pretty much on the border the northish northernest place it was the fact be. that obviously i'm not great with accents certainly from obviously ireland i roughly know a few and he did sound quite northern irish but he bought us a pint he bought us a pint so that was nice of him. he did and then we went for some food mm. in sam's bar yes and we stumbled across some reprobates something i think i think we should mention this because yeah. it was it was absolutely phenomenal so we're in the bar quite quiet few football matches going on. We had a burger. Do you have a burger? Yeah, I did. I had a burger. It's really good. And there was a couple of... Uh, one particular guy who I knew, knew uh, no, called Craig, he walked past. I said, oh, Craig. And he came over and... That's exactly how you said it as well. Oh, Craig. And, and suddenly, we had like 10 or 12 people at our tables. Yeah, it was the banter table. And these golfers... <laughs> I won't tell them all the nicknames and all this. There was that one guy who'd flown from Ireland yeah. who told us maybe 15 times that he'd flown from Ireland that yeah. morning. They'd all been abusing already. Yeah. Okay. They were way ahead of us. When we were seven deep by this, these, yeah. these were these were double figures comfortably. And they were playing in a golf day over the next two, couple of days, which we just found fascinating. Yeah. Fight for par. Fighting for par. No. Par from par. Far from par Instagram channel. <laughs> And this Instagram channel, let me find a guy it right called now. Dan. He's got about eight thousand followers on Instagram. I think he used to be uh, like a plumber or something on the tools or whatever. And he set up a, an Instagram account to document his journey to golf. I don't think he's a great golfer. He won't mind us saying that. He's got a, a kind of almost like a, I don't want to say this, but a cult like following. Yeah, it's crazy. They had a golf day there at the Belfry for two days. And UK versus or England, UK versus Ireland or UK versus Ireland. Can't remember what it was. It was anyway GB versus Ireland or something. And. Uh, Two days playing the PGA course and the Brabazon. Loads of drink. Great banter. Actually says on their Instagram, the working class golfer. Nice. Um, really well organised event. Yeah. They all had t-shirts on and there was banners around the first tee and everything. And we were just like, how the hell have we never heard of this? I think what was mad, and I think I almost offended a couple of guys, which I truthfully didn't mean to. I was almost quite perplexed to why they were. when you're starting doing the Sambucas. And yeah. <laughs> and the salt and everything. Um, no, but, that's the, is it tequila or Sambuca? Was it salt? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's Parmesan cheese. <laughs> Um, no, it was because if you had a YouTube channel that had like 8,000 subscribers that was kind of 
create a, a community that then got people to want to go on a trip. I'd kind of get that. Yeah. But it was the fact that it was like an Instagram account that doesn't have loads and loads of followers. No. And you get loads of Instagram accounts that have 8,000 followers. Um, so the fact all these guys had come to play in his golf day, and there was one last year as well, and they were so passionate about it, and they were a great group of guys. I found it quite um, mind-blowing, but in a good way. I was yeah. really respectful of it, and I thought the more we learned about it and about Dan and what he was doing... These guys were so passionate about the golf and the community they've built. They had little group chats. They, they were did. saying there's like a big group chat. There's then a spin off on the different teams. have got a group chat. They all had a parallel on. Yeah, they did. that the next day. And it was like really cool. So fair play. And we went down when we had, we had our meeting with, with a brand on the day after. Mm-hmm. Um, and we went and had breakfast. And we went out to actually watch a few of the guys tee off on the PGA course. Yeah. It was tipping it down. It was such a horrible day for him. I felt really bad for him. But spirits were still, like, high, and they were, like, just buzzing, weren't they? It was so cool, yeah. Um, no, for, I re- really respected that, and the fact it just proves what, obviously, um, you know, people on YouTube and social media can create these communities, and it was yeah. good. We've seen, in person now, a new driver. And, and you know, not even just a driver, a whole catalogue of new yeah. golf clubs coming out next year. We have, and we've also signed an NDA to say we won't speak about it in too much depth. So, well, I've signed it. So you can, I suppose I signed on behalf of you. So what, you could talk about it now, then sack me, and then you're, you're fine, I guess. So the brand rhymes with um, Flamatade. Nice. <laughs> 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 um, but we've seen product. We have, and it won't be any mad surprise to people because this brand in question every year around January launch new um, I was say metals, but are, are they metals? Are they now? I don't Ooh. know. Um, and yeah, we got to see them and pretty, we didn't hit them just, or you didn't hit them just yet, nor did I, but we didn't hit them just yet. Um, but maybe what we could talk about then on, on, in this is a bit more, we had spoke about this briefly before another podcast, but a bit more of how this journey goes then from, from you first hearing about these clubs may or may not be coming out so then the review actually landing because it's something that i think people are interested in how does this whole process work yeah because a lot of people will just see the video being released and go what the hell yeah. like we've only just announced it so often um and, and this has taken years to develop you know relationships with brands and when i say relationship truly just professional relationships where there's no contracts i don't get paid by any of these brands to review or test products um but what will typically happen they'll have a marketing guy on on each brand pretty much and roughly about three months before the product launch Mm -hmm. we'll often get an email saying new products being released um sometimes they'll show images there and then yep not all the time no it depends on the brand um Often you have to sign, like Guy said, an NDA, I know that non-disclosure agreement. Yeah, and all that I have to say is that we will not talk about the product and give things away until the embargo date lifts, which would be like, let's say, 1st of January. Yeah, That's it, really. And, and if we do talk about it, we can, in theory, I suppose, be sued. Yeah, so they'll set that date. Sometimes it can change. Mm-hmm. Um, but often for some of the biggest brands, so I'm going to use this year as example, TaylorMade and Callaway both released their drivers on the 3rd of January, if I'm not mistaken. Something like that, yeah. Um, and they'll even set a time of when the, yeah. when their embargo lifts. And that's why you'll often see on those days, YouTube and social media is flooded, full of images, reviews, whatever it is, of said products. Yes. So that's kind of what happens there. What happens then from us, we'll agree to go and either meet said brands, they'll come unto us, and they'll present the product to us. Yeah. Sometimes physical product, sometimes it's just imagery mm. until you actually get the product set. Yeah. Um, and on there, and I think what's been good now over the years, brands have become much more aware of the process I prefer. I don't want to see these all singing, all dancing marketing videos. No, but I think also that's that's down to yourself as well, because obviously when you first started doing this 10 years ago, it was probably a couple of years in before you started to yeah. brands you probably were and i don't blame you quite keen to go down to the headquarters and have these presentations yeah. so it was new and, and that in some way would have felt like a level of accomplishment from yourself which i understand if you if, if you started up a youtube channel or somebody listening now or watching starts a channel today and in six months time ping had taken them to the head office and given them a driver to review you'd feel like that's some level of accomplishment but you'd gone so far beyond that you kind of found a place where you thought right this is how i want this to, to work and yeah. they can either entertain it or or if they don't, that's fine. I'll just buy the clubs myself when they come yeah. out. So we, you know, we're in a much stronger position now. Where I'm, I'm I, sorry, let me turn this light. 
I thought this laptop was on uh, silent. Um, yeah, so basically the brands now are much more switched on. Um, often they'll well, they'll cut through a bit of the BS and just kind of get to the point, won't they, really? Just have like nine out of ten levels of BS, where sometimes it can be 12 out of ten levels yeah. of BS, can't it? So, you know, and I'll often, I like a bit of BS. <laughs> I'll often call them out on a few things. Yeah, you had a, you had a, we can't mention it, but you had a really good point on one of them, uh, Club Ed so, Speed one. So often, often the brands then tell you how good the product this year has been compared to previous years. Yeah. Sometimes they'll say, our driver this year has managed to beat competitor A, B, and C, which they're not often, they don't ever use the names of brands, yeah. but you can tell by the colours they've used yeah. who which brand is which. And every brand is, does this. A well, big one they all do as well at the end of the year, like so they'll come with a new driver and they'll say, this is the new driver. It's the, the Rick Shields Mark III edition. And look at this. It's it's actually beat Epic and it's beat Stealth. And you say, yeah, but you're almost going against what are now going to be old drivers. Let's see you against the new version of the yeah. May, the new yeah. version of the Callaway, because that's where the real fight would be. But they can't, they can't do that exactly, at the time. Exactly, because they've not got it. So um, often they'll go through all the spiel. We'll ask questions. Um, they'll, they'll often now show us a, a club head that's kind of been um dismantled yeah uh, and you can have a look at head. it and this that and the other uh, again time to ask questions and then through that process certainly this brand that we saw last week a couple of weeks ago they didn't actually have any products for me there and then they had products to show us mm. but it wasn't my product mm. um often then they'll send it in my spec or if i've not been for a fitting for a while we'll have a new fitting so they've got got all my specs ready um, and then they'll send it a couple of months earlier the embargo and then that is the end of conversation communication with that brand it is and that's where the, the real fun starts to take place what we'd first do then typically is take close-ups of the product on like an iphone camera a really good quality camera and that is to show the product how it should look and we say should look because sometimes brand send us product you can't believe this but it's true and it'll be scratched or dinted. And you kind of think, that is just ridiculous because... <laughs> Not many brands do that now, they but don't, they have but done. It, even in the last year or two, yeah. there's been some brands who, who, are, who I won't name, but they'll know. And you think... <laughs> they'll know. Yeah, they'll know. You know, it's it's it, without putting you on some pedestal, this, your video on the product will probably get more views than any other creator, hopefully anyway. And, you know, they should almost be hand-delivering it to ensure it comes pristine. But anyway, we do that. And then obviously that's when the testing starts and the real fun starts and you start whacking some balls. Yeah. And I, and I hit three... And I come up with my review. Yeah, same as last year. <laughs> That's how it works. No, I must admit, we. I think over the last couple of years, this is where we have had more of an open communication, even just you and me going to the range, whacking a few, getting them on GC Quad, getting them on Top Tracer. Kind of a, a bit more of a, a, a holistic approach to testing the product. And we don't have a camera film in every single shot ever, but it gives us much more of an understanding of when we come to make the video and the review. I know, okay, oh, I love this about the product. I don't like that about the product. This is really good. That's not as good. Why didn't they do this? Or they should have, you know, so it's, it's a lot more rounded and we package that up in a really nice kind of, you know, reviews can never be super long, 15, 20 minutes max. Of the of the latest and greatest, and I'm using quotation marks from those people listening, of the of the new drivers. Well, that's the thing, and you have to take time testing the golf clubs for, for a couple of reasons. The first reason is performance based. You're not a robot, so I could give you now the new tailor made driver that's going to come out next year, and you might hit five with it, and it might not work very well for you. But you might have thinned them, or you might fit them very much out the top of the face or the heel or whatever. So you need to do a large sample to understand how it actually works. When you do hit it well, when you hit it slightly off, etc. And also, and a bit more of a point that we've probably realised more in the last couple of years, is that some products, or whatever it might be, they take a while to get used to. And a silly example, but I'll use it, was recently my car was getting some work done. So I borrowed my wife's car for the week. And well, she obviously used it as well, but I, I used it when I needed it. And for like the first three days, I was like, oh, it's nowhere near as nice as my car. They said, I prefer my own car. And then by the time I got used to it, I was like, actually, I quite like it. And there's certain things that at first I wasn't struck on. And I started to actually like but that was only from getting used to it. Yeah. And it's like that with a golf club. I know it's different because you are mostly looking for performance, but you are looking for feel, yeah. for confidence, for the looks of a golf club as well. And sometimes you might first see something and go, not a fan of look of that new driver. And then all of a sudden you're like, actually, I do like that. Mm. And it takes Congrats time, you, exactly. Um, out of scale of one to ten, mm -hmm. okay, one being absolutely not at all, it's even a step backwards, to ten being, oh my God, this thing's the best thing I've ever seen. How would you rate the new driver that we saw last um, week that we can't talk about that's probably going to be released in january yeah <laughs> i'll give you more of that when we try it but on what they say what i thought of the looks what i think of the story probably a six weirdly i'm a little bit higher oh yeah this year yeah that's exciting i kind of saw it i was like 
Hmm. Interesting. Mm. That ticks a lot of boxes for me. Um, so I'm, I'm much more kind of eight, possibly even nine. Wow, that is big. Um, so we'll see what other brands are going to do as well. Um, I, I'm very upset with Ping. I think I can't remember mentioning this in the last one or not because it was two weeks ago we recorded the podcast, but the new one with the stuff on it, I'm not a huge fan the of. looks. Yeah, looks-wise. But if it performs anything as good as the current one, it will be great. But looks-wise, I'd just like it to be clean. Well, I've got, I must admit, we've got the irons now. The i230s, yeah. they look phenomenal. I'm going to review them very soon, maybe even tomorrow, but the video won't be out tomorrow, but soon. And the new crossover, yeah, that actually looks nice. I've not, I've not unboxed it yet, but it does look, from what I've seen on images and videos so far, it looks mint. Mm. Looks really it's good. exciting. I think this is always an exciting time. And you know, I asked a question again to this brand thing, um, about you know how year on year everybody who watches our podcast watches your videos etc they know that golf brands have kind of hit a limit really with the the rules in place by the usj and the rna how do you keep getting better so can you explain it in really simple terms he explained it not in particularly simple terms <laughs> it wasn't did he really simple at all but basically they're saying a simple trying to make this as simple as i can that there's more room across the face still with these drives isn't there so yeah. i guess from that if you nut a tailor-made stealth that's currently out on the market versus an m2 out the middle there's not gonna be a great deal in it like right in the middle perfect strike but if you start to spray it which most golfers let's be honest even we, the best players in the world do yeah then that's where you might see a bit more on but even that bit more you might be looking at three yards on a slightly toey heel but toey strike versus the old driver so it's not something that's massive but the brands aren't going to just stop making golf clubs are they? they're going to keep doing it and it's the marketing that sells them let's be honest i think that's the one thing now that the products have got better certainly drivers like how many times do you hit drive and you go oh, i didn't quite feel right yeah but actually you get down there and you go that's done pretty mm -hmm. good yeah do you know what i mean that's yeah. that's done better than I expected and if that can continue to get better it takes a little bit of the skill out of the game but it's obviously if it's making it easier and making it it's the same for kind of most people using modern products. The other, oh, I'd love a brand. There might be some, somebody might re uh, correct me on this. I'd love a brand to bring out a stupidly forgiving driver. Mm. So, for example, the Ping G four twenty five Max that we use is very forgiving. Callaway have a Max that's very forgiving. A lot of these brands do have a forgiving driver, but they could still make it. They could even shorten the shaft a little bit. Most people, the current length of a driver shaft at forty five and a half inches is too long. It's just too unforgiving. You're gonna you're gonna strike it across the face. You're gonna lose ball speed. You might gain club head speed, but it doesn't always result in ball speed. But if they made a shorter shafted driver, I don't know they could make it even more. Just, just, and it's not many of the longest drivers. I'd be like no. square drivers. I know yep. they didn't really work because the noise of them and the look of them. But make a driver that doesn't claim to be longer than other drivers, but helps you hit more fairways. I wonder if that would sell. There was a driver. And it's if I tell you the headline of the name of this driver, tell me if this was forgiven or not. Okay. okay. Taylor made SLDR. No. Not at all, forgiven. was it? Like one of the least forgiving drivers ever. Yeah. However, they also brought one out in 16 degrees. Yes. Which was one of the most forgiving drivers yeah ever mm. so it wasn't even they didn't even change the head yeah it's they actually loft. just put more loft on yeah, it it's good and good it was point. unbelievably forgiving like scarily and and i don't believe enough driver manufacturers make drivers with enough loft that's true like that um is it out yet yeah and they uh and uh, anesis yes driver. The video. that was high launch mm, like that was 13. a forgiving driver like that, that felt easy just to pop up in the air. Yeah. And I feel like any time you can get a driver popping up in the air a little bit more, it's less likely to curve off to the right or to the left. Absolutely. Um, we got any more on that? I've got one more quick one. Okay. The driver that's been brought out by Ping, yes. which we actually forgot to mention, or forgot, it kind of somewhat slipped out, slipped my mind anyway. Um, oh God, what's his name? He won with it the week we did the podcast. That's going to do my head in now. Was it Was it Bradley Keegan? Did he win? Keegan Bradley? Yeah, <laughs> Bradley Keegan. <laughs> you see? Uh, give me one second. Played went, left mid, Wigan Athletic. <laughs> where was the event? Uh, the one before... Oh, sorry, give me two seconds. Give me two, oh, 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 two seconds. Everyone just wait. Just, You're running. Just, just, bit wait, just, stop, just stop for a minute. Well, right I will warm, warm this up then before you find that. We have okay, a Keegan Bradley, the Zozo Championship. He had it in the bag. Yeah, in Japan he had it in the bag. Right. And he had it in the bag in Japan because it's bloody out in Asia already. Oh, gosh, yeah, ping. Not a fan of how they've done that either. But anyway, things I'm a fan of is emails from our listeners now, viewers. <laughs> oh, nice. And we've had some great ones. Um, the email, as always, is podcast at rickshields.com. And don't spell Shields incorrectly. Even people, even the people that email us about projects and things, they sometimes put S-H-E-E. 
I L S, and that's not how you spell it. It's S H I E L S. This guy spent many a shift slaving, washing pots. To change not, <laughs> not for people to forget his surname, all right? So that's how you spell it. Um, but on a serious note, we've had three. One of them I'm going to leave for a minute because that's going to bring us on to our next topic of this podcast. One's a shorty, and one is a long one, which we always say if you send us a long email, we'll, we'll read it. But we probably won't read it on the show because it's just too long. This one coming up in a minute is long, but it's so meaningful. I have to read it. And I might paraphrase some of it to keep it flowing. But it's one of the best emails I've ever, ever, ever had. And I may cry when we read it. So that's something to wait for. Um, so this first one, though. Was, was it from me? <laughs> I think I should quit golf. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd laugh at that. Um, <laughs> no, this next one is from Chris Green. And the title is Who the F is Rick Shields? So well, correctly. Yep. Good. Has it got me in? I thought, right, what was this about? I love a bit of clickbait. However, be clever with your clickbait. Some of it's getting extreme now. Like, guy has nice muscles. I don't read them ones. <laughs> if you say, like, guy's a tosser, I'll read that one. Oh, wow. So be clever with it. Be clever with it. Um, so it says... I feel like we need to start putting an 18 rating on these podcasts. Yeah. So bear in mind, the title of this was Who the F is Rick Shields? Okay. So I thought this is going to be... Oh. Hi. First of all, let's... Right, I need to start reading properly if I'm going to read an email. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, let me explain the title of this email. I am the captain at Golf Club, one of the clubs on route for Rick's charity walk this year in Scotland. Correct. Lovely I place. was golfing that day. When I went into the pro shop to sign in, the pro, Gordon, asked me if I was hanging around to possibly say hello to Rick Shields. I had no idea who Rick was at that stage. <laughs> Hence the reason for the title of this email. Love it. But now... I actually hope he said to Gordon that. <laughs> <laughs> but now you have become a permanent fixture in the house via YouTube or the podcast in the car If I or if I'm out running. I love all the content, but especially a fan of Break 75. Rick has played some of the courses I've played, including Formby and King's Barnes, which is my favourite course I've ever played. It's good to compare how I've done versus how Rick does. It's usual that, he, he, that Chris done much worse than you, Rick. Good, good to know. <laughs> Until he sees the mouth. I was going to say. <laughs> uh, the good thing about being late to this party is I'm always finding loads of new videos that I've not seen yet. I went back to the start of the podcast as well, and I've been listening to the current one, which is quite weird because I've also been listening to them. So he's basically, I think he's doing the current one and then going back to the start as well. So he's like nice. listening to episodes 10, 11, and 12, and then 154. So he's kind so of all over he'll the place. End on episode 75. Yes, exactly. Uh, basically, that was the email saying, anyway, keep up the good work, all the best. So there you go. Uh, nice. An example of someone, one of the very few people who doesn't know who you are, Rick. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> who then comes on to be a fan. <laughs> but that was a great email. But this one now, and it is, I'm going to try and keep this as, as trim as I can, this email. But I don't want to miss too much out. And I do feel kind of well up on this. So I don't know why. Well, I do know why you'll hear. Um, it says, it's from Alex, I don't want to read his surname only because I've not asked him if I can. I did send him an email back about this email. But at the time, I wasn't sure that I was going to read it out because it's so long. And I've had to think about it and we've got him. And I think we might have to do something with him as well. So Alex, his name is. Hi, Rick and Guy. Not sure where to start this email, but I wanted to inform you both of my recent journey and how Rick's videos have helped me during what has been the uh, most difficult time of my life. Sorry, it's a bit of a ramble. I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, a blood cancer, in March earlier this year. At this point, the only golf I'd ever played was a kid some 20 years ago on a bit of a pitch and putt course in Withenshaw. The only golf club I've ever owned was a Wilson 8-iron purchased from the Barbers, which is a bit random, <laughs> around the corner from my house. So I'd take my own club to the uh, pitch and putt. After some months of starting my intensive chemotherapy regime, I needed to find some sort of physical activity that wasn't too taxing, but still helped me get out of the house once a week and get some exercise in. Before cancer, I'd been a uh, keen hiker, but that type of physical exertion is something I can't currently cope with. I figured, uh, after playing a bit um, of PJ 2K21, that golf could be a good thing to get into, even at 36 years old. Old. So, I did a small amount of research, watched a few videos, and bought myself a second-hand Wilson package for 99 quid, just to get into the game. At this point, I was definitely naive to how difficult golf is. This became inevitably apparent after my first visit to your old stomping ground at Trafford Golf Centre, where I topped, sliced, hooked, and shanked, and duffed golf balls um, about 100 yards ahead of me. I was effing woeful, but I loved every second of it and instantly wanted to improve my game and learn how to be better. And that's where Rick comes in. In searching about on YouTube for advice and tips for game improvement, I came across your videos for your complete golf swing guide, which was an absolute godsend. As I continued to seek tips and tricks on how to improve, your videos became more and more inspiring. 
I'm sure you've been told before, but you have the unbelievable ability to put an absolute novice at ease and explain the game in a simple but incredible and effective and positive manner. No wonder your channel has been so successful. Rick's head swelling and swelling and swelling as reading this. I just take my hat off. <laughs> in fact, this um, felt like a. In fact, oh, sorry, I've lost my track now. In, it felt like this normal, down to earth lad from Bolton wasn't judging how bad I was at golf, uh, but genuinely wanted to help us enjoy the game more. In the weeks and months I've followed, my game is starting to improve Im- immensely, and I'm shooting the high 90s, looking to get that down to the 80s, but most of all, I'm just having fun. I'm now at the point where I'm looking to improve my setup too. My wife has been getting frustrated with the amount of golf apparel that's suddenly flooding our house and the money I've been spending on golf because it's not cheap. In the week or so after I have chemo, I'm barely able to do anything, which has left me leisurely watching your Break 75 challenges and, of course, your podcast videos. You and Guy give me such a passion and a bit of an obsession for the sport. You offer me something to focus on and enjoy in the days when I'm feeling shit around a chemo, but which also gives me enthusiasm to get out. I'm going to go in here to get out <laughs> um, and play. Um, I haven't got the energy or strength for hiking, so golf is now his new love. It's also given my stepdad renewed love for the game too, as he's picked up his old um, golf clubs. Okay, nearly at the end now. That's good, good <laughs> You're doing good. On Tuesday, this so today, and this podcast comes out Tuesday, I'll be having my last round of chemotherapy, and I'm happy to say that I'm in remission. I can properly start my recovery from cancer after next week, and I will be playing golf as much as I can to strengthen my body and mind. I found golf hard and frustrating, but also incredibly fun, gratifying and rewarding. While it might sound a bit mad, your YouTube channel has been a massive part of my engagement with the sport, but also helped me with the battle of the last nine months. So I just want to say a massive thank you. I hope you're aware of the overwhelming positive effect you have. Heard to no more rounds of chemotherapy, but loads more rounds of golf. Amazing, Alex. What a oh, story that is. I feel really, like really real. nice. I know it's a long one, but it had to be read. <clears throat> it's amazing, isn't it? What a legend. So I'm going to email him back, and I think well, we need to go meet him at Trafford. And no, um, let's do better. Let's let's invite him to a round of golf oh, with Marriott. Class. Let's do it. You, me, and him, and we'll, we'll have a nice little round of golf. So Alex, I'll send you an email. I'll give you my number, and we'll sort this out soon. That's when you're that's feeling mad, up to it. It's it, it's just mad. God, I think I find that. The amount of people that play golf from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, and, you know, everyone has their own challenges and difficulties, mm. and obviously Alex sounds like he's had it horrendous for the last nine months. It's mad how kind of a passion, mm. albeit golf or whatever you're into, can kind of keep you spurred on, can keep you motivated, and it's it's great to hear off him. And, uh, oh, very nice, very very touching email. Okay, so on another note, we had another email in. This is a good one. That was a very good one. Well, that was the best email I've probably ever had. So um, thanks, Alex. This one is from George. It says, RPXG done. Uh-oh. His... So, <laughs> oh, I feel like we've come from that to this. I know. That's, that's, that's the journey this podcast has. People have been like probably in the car or on a run and feeling a bit weepy now and we've got to go back in. So I was just minding my business, scrolling through Facebook this morning when I came across the all new PXG. 0211 Woods. To my surprise, they were massively low priced. Drivers at 229, fairways at 179, and hybrids at 159. Have PXG lost their pull based on branding? I personally wouldn't have them anyways, but are they done considering how low they are now charging against other brands? This is something we spoke about, Rick, between us. I don't think we've done it on the podcast before about what a strange brand PXG is. And I think just before we come on to the topic, I just want to clarify a few things I can almost expect to see in the comments or people maybe not getting um, our points the best way. We know that golf clubs can be expensive and too expensive, and you've done many, many reviews on more affordable golf clubs. So this isn't when we say about PXG being cheap, we know that still £229 to drive in the current climate is a lot of money. But considering where they started at and where some of their products still are, they've made some very strange decisions. So I want to hear your thoughts on this, Rick. What do you think of PXG? It's one of the strangest turnaround and change directions of a company I have ever seen. Mm. Ever. Now, I'm just looking online here. 2014, it was founded. Yeah. Okay. And I feel around the years of kind of 2016, 17 is when they really kind of hit the scenes. It was, it was just before I started working for you. And that was in sweat. That was the end of 17 because I don't think we've done a great deal of PXG, no. but you had done. And when they first came out, they were very, very brash in their aggression yeah. towards dominating the market. 
they signed some big players. In fact, it was because it was when Nike just moved out of clubs. Yes. Because they snatched up players like Charles Swartzel. Correct. That like was they, middle of 16, like in they, August. They took Charles Swartzel, arguably one of the bigger names in Nike. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he was the current Masters champion or he probably wasn't, but he obviously won the Masters. PXG came in and snatched him up. And they snatched up another five or six players in that period of time. Yeah. Okay. And they came out making these brat these claims. And Bob Parson is the founder. That's why it's PXG, Parsons Extreme Golf. Now, Bob Parson is a real character. And I'll come on to a little story about him in a minute. Billionaire. Billion billionaire. And he he loved his golf and was buying every golf club under the sun, lives in Arizona. Um, and basically a friend of his one time said, Dale, you're buying all these golf clubs. Why don't you just make them your own? Make them yourself. <laughs> And he said, okay, I will. Watch this. And he took a very different strategy in the fact that he then headhunted all of the best engineers, and a lot of them from Ping. Yeah. Because Ping, is again, is based in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. And that's why you'll see a lot of similarities between PXG and Ping. Certainly in the early days there was, wasn't there? So what happened was um, PXG went with a different mindset. A lot of brands would, would start with making a product, and they would already have a price in mind. So let's say it's tailor-made. They're saying, well, that driver, we're going to roughly sell it for 500 yeah. quid. And they would work backwards from that and go, well, if that's the case, how much do the raw materials need to cost? How much is the processing? How much are we going to spend on marketing? So that it can be priced at 500 pounds And that driver. must be how most products in the world are made because that's the sensible way, I guess. Bob Parsons didn't <laughs> want to do that. Okay. So the story is he went out to get the best engineers and they he said, make the best best possible golf clubs okay period <laughs> and we'll price it afterwards so we'll work out how much the materials have cost us how much the r d's cost us then whatever that price is that's the price that is the price or, or obviously with the profit yeah, yeah yeah um so they went out and they they had no limitations the engineers probably for them a dream job because i bet they've had to work in con you know confined restrictions on pricing yeah definitely suddenly those shackles get released and, and you can make any product you want as long as it's obviously governed by the, the usga and the rna but you can make everything you want and there's no price on it okay and that's why when phg really really hit the scene it wasn't uncommon for their drivers once you factored in even a, a shaft upgrade it was getting close to a thousand pounds for a driver and that was something that i weirdly respected and i'll tell you why that was because we all know that you can buy a casio watch for 14 quid or whatever you can also buy a rolex for 20 grand you can buy a whatever a, a patek philippe whatever they call for like half a million dollars if not obviously loads more and you're not buying that watch to tell the time any better in fact it probably tells the time worse than the digital casio but you're buying it as a luxury item and I think what PXG did, they kind of filled a bit of a void that wasn't really here in the Western market. Because at this point, you weren't seeing much of Honma. You had like your Vegas and stuff knocking about, but there wasn't many so, like top, top jewellery items in golf. Was there? You had Scotty Cameron Putters, but not many of these brands were doing that. So, and, and often those jewellery items didn't massively back it up with a performance claim. Exactly. A Scotty Cameron doesn't really tell you in the whole more putts, do they? We just had a picture of both. It had, we are performance, we are going to hit it longer, we are better, but you're also going to pay through the nose for it. And as much as most people listening, including myself, can't relate to those consumers, there's a lot of guys out there at these expensive golf courses who've got a Bentley, who've got a Ferrari, who want the clubs their friends can't afford. And again, remind you, Bob Parson is a billionaire all his friends are billionaires yeah. he's not he can't bring out a product that is cheap no. in that in that time frame he had to bring out a product for, probably for his own right and i'll tell you why i know this because i actually had dinner with pop, pop parsons wow um as they were kind of growing and building and i'd reviewed a few products from phg um they invited me to a media day and i often don't go to media days because i find them a bit boring and a bit i don't know not not that much fun but the phg one intrigued me because mm. i was like all right let's let's have a look under the hood of this company and i suppose you didn't know much about the brand you know about tailor-made in callaway etc but you wouldn't have known about phg so we got everyone got invited to the Wisley, which is an nice. amazing 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 venue we're on the driving range hitting balls hit testing new phg getting fitted and over flies a helicopter <laughs> And not just any helicopter. Not guy. your helicopter. Not my one. I, mine's red and black. <laughs> everyone, everyone knows that. This was a big helicopter, right? And whispers started big to go chopper. around. 
starts <laughs> being a, a great big chopper. <laughs> Whispers started to go around. It's Bob. It's Mr. Parson. It's Bob. It's, I was like, oh my God, right, okay. Inevitably, it was. Okay. Parked on the driving range, helicopter. I mean, I was still hitting balls. I didn't really care. But yeah. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the driving range, helicopter lands. Mr. Parson, Bob, gets out. Okay. Does he have and sunglasses on? Oh, 100%. Yeah. He's an older guy. I can't remember. I don't know how old he is now, but um, I'll have a quick look. He is... Um, I want to say 75. I don't know that. 71. Oh, not a bad guy. So that would, he would have been about 66 at the time. Yeah. When, oh, no. Uh, yeah, 66. Um, he, he founded, as well, a bit of backstory. He found, what, where he made his most of his money was GoDaddy.com. Yeah. When the internet boom was happening, he set up a website where you could actually register domain names, and he made an absolute, obviously, killing off that. Um, and, he, and he walks over... And he speaks to people, and he, he would seem like a very nice bloke. Mm. Okay. After we did a bit of testing, there was a um, a bit of a meet and greet with Bob, and he was up at the front. There's a big room full of media, and loads of people asking questions about the product, and you know, blah blah blah. blah. But a lot of the people in the room were kind of quote unquote bum lickers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Is that a lot of you can say bum. Yeah, I can say bum lickers. <laughs> bum as much as you want. Um, in America, that's funny. I don't know if we can so say you, that. You, we can't say that. <laughs> <way around. laughs> um, no, it's not. The it's not is, funny. It is in America. That's why they have fanny packs. We call them bum bags. They call them fanny packs. Well, I'm not keen on saying it that way around. Anyway, they were very much PXG fans. Okay, Lickers. they saw they saw <laughs> Bob Parson as as the, the god. Yeah. Okay, so a lot of the questions were very. I don't know. Just not very. Just Bob, very, can you lend me hundred quid? <laughs> just a bit like sucking up to him so there was there was one thing whereas you on the other hand walked in spat on the floor <laughs> started graffiti and pxg is crap <laughs> you so were smoking I, indoors as well <laughs> i went in with a slightly different mindset because they were talking about how who their target audience is and in my head it was the bentley guy yeah yeah their target all is the bentley guy yeah. of course it is we had guys in there saying that it, it's for everybody i'm mm-hmm. like it can't be for everybody so i, I actually unless they were speaking about six years in the future well yeah so i put my arm up and said well I'm, I'm you know i think for the price of the product i don't believe it is for everybody and i think if you're trying to be exclusive or you know uh, if you oh i can't remember i would now anyway I asked, I asked a really good question and whatever i didn't get kicked out so it must have been fine anyway at the Wisley. Afterwards, there was a big dinner, mm-hmm. okay? It was like a wedding, right? They'd, they'd laid it all out, right? And all these, there about 10 tables all laid out, white table cloths, all, all laid out to perfection. And there's a table plan, okay? It's about 100 people there, probably roughly. It's a tenner table. And there's a table plan. You've got table one and up to 10. So I'm thinking, I wonder where I'm going to be sat. I knew a few people in the room, not loads, but a lot of them were either account holders from PSG. Yeah, spend a lot of money. Other media yeah. or... I think there was a few kind of just golfer fans there as well, you know, make up the numbers. So, um, <laughs> the bum lickers. So <laughs> I'm looking on this, on this list and, and I'm thinking, where the hell's my name? Cause I thought, well, I'm not going to look at the top. I'll look down at the bottom and I started from table 10 and worked my way up. And I was, I how got, times have changed. I was like, where the hell am I? I'm on the bloody top table. <laughs> Rick Shields on table one. And you know what guy? It said Renee Parson, his wife, Bob Parson or Parsons. Rick Shields. Wow. I was you must third like, on the list. They had you down as a bum licker. So on this table, there was Rene, his wife, who was absolutely lovely. Bob. Yeah. So th- Rene's there. I'll be Rene. Hey, Rick, nice to meet you. Bob. I'll be Bob. Hey, Rick, nice to meet you. Ricky Shields. You be Rick. Hi. <laughs> 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 Hi, Mr. Parson. <laughs> Can I and, then, your bum? and then there were seven other people... And if I'm honest with you, 93 other people in the room who were jealous of me. Yeah, of course. And I, I really wasn't that fussed. I wasn't. No. I was like, oh, I'm sat next to the main man. This is quite cool. But I wasn't I wasn't fussed. Anyway, we got chatting. And as I got chatting to him and understanding his background and who he was, I absolutely 100% understood why the golf clubs were made at that price. Because he's just, he's a billionaire. Oh, yeah. He's just flown in from a helicopter. He's, t- he's, dr- he's asking me to drink his wine that was like f- five grand a bottle. Yeah. He lives in a life that wasn't, isn't the same as anybody else. Well, yeah. And that's the thing. It's very hard for us to get our head around, but there is a market in all goods, no matter what they are, to pay stupid amounts of money. You could buy a, an old Ford Fiesta for 300 quid that you get from A to B, but people drive around in 500,000 pound 
Lamborghinis or whatever because it's a style. It's a thing. It's not about the. He, it's performance to some degree, clearly, but it's a status symbol, isn't it? He could have. He could have arrived at the Wisley, or he could have arrived at Withington Municipal in an Uber. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, of course he doesn't. Yeah, he's Bob Parson. He's he's a billionaire. He wanted to arrive at the Wisley in a helicopter. He wanted to drink five thousand pound bottle of wine with his probably Gucci shoes on and his. You know, that's his, that's his life. But question then, do you think at this point in time, this was again five or six years ago, that they were, li- the, 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 these two things could marry up, but were they exclusive? Were they either looking to literally make the best, best, best golf clubs and then the price then followed that? Or was it they were actually looking to market a set of golf clubs to the guys who've got more money than cents? I think, I think his decimal point was two or three points away from everybody else in the world at that time. So I, for, for him, I don't think he... he I think for him, he wanted to make a product that was just blow, technologically blow everyone out of the water. That, mm-hmm. I think that was in his soul. But he wasn't scared if the driver was 10 grand. Because mm. he would buy a driver for 10 grand, I'm pretty sure of it, yeah. if, he, if he felt like it was the best product. So I just think there was a, there was a multitude of reasons why the price was so hot, so well, then, high. We, we then saw in the, in the kind of years coming, a couple of years after that then, from, from when you met him, that drivers like you said were 800 quid, a grand of certain shafts in the irons are a lot of money. And they did start to gain some level of traction. And I respected at that moment in time, after spending the day at the Wisley, after meeting him, after hitting the product, not being blown away by the product whatsoever. But I could understand it. They were hitting a target audience, like people who were aspiring. Like I had like John Beasley, a really good friend of mine who, who I qualified for open yeah, qualifying. Yeah. He's like, What's his PhD stuff yeah, yeah. like? Of course. He, he was desperate to try it, desperate to test it, because it's like it was put on this extra level. Like, surely more expensive means better performance. Well, the way I perceived it from from trying a few, and obviously watching some of your videos at the time, with the, my thoughts, and these may be incorrect, were that the clubs were no um, better than Titleist, Callaway, Ping, TaylorMade. But to be fair, no worse. But yet the price point they were at really made them appeal to the guy that wanted that luxury, that again, that drives to the golf club in the Bentley, the Ferrari, whatever. And we started to see people using them. And I started to see a lot of people who had a full set of everything. You just knew they were obviously made of money. And that was where they felt they slotted in. And again, that's not something that all of us watching and listening could use. That's but equally, we all can't drive Ferraris, can we? And to me, again, I may be wrong, it kind of made sense. It was for that guy. However, I agree with that, but I also saw a lot of people buying those golf clubs that that really wouldn't that weren't driving a Bentley. But just wanted them. And they were, maybe they took were, out a bank loan or whatever. They, yeah. they, and, and again, I'm not for one second categorising this, and I don't want to sound bad at all, but turning up in a car that, that maybe didn't warrant pulling out a full set of PHGs out the out the back. Do you but, know what I mean? And, and that's not me being stereotypical or... But just didn't seem like the target market. But that's, I suppose... It, it, it's... It, that's how things happen, though, is it? Because some people might wear five hundred pound Gucci trainers, but only have a five hundred pound car. But their priority is they want to be seen to be wearing the best stuff. So it, it'll, I could see how that would also happen in golf. Like for example, if let's let's say back in two thousand and seventeen or whatever it was, eighteen, if a, if somebody arrived with a tour bag of PHG, mm-hmm. okay, let's say we're outside the Marriott, mm-hmm. okay, and there's a set of clubs left there, tour bag PHG, everything in the bag is PHG, okay describe what the golfer is going to look like when he walks out the door. My What's he going to be wearing? What's he going to be? My honest opinion is a bit of a, well, I don't want to say it's a little upset people, but in reality, someone that's probably... A bit flashy. A bit flashy. Mid, 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 mid to late 50s, they've got a Rolex on. He's quite slim. He's got like a slim fit. But he wears a bit of Hugo Boss. He He's done well for yeah. himself. He's got a nice five, six bedroom detached house. Foot joy classics. Yeah, worst case, he's got like an Audi A6. Yeah. Worst case. And, and that... <laughs> That is where they were at. Yeah. That you know, that's who who I would see if I saw a set of PHG. And to be honest, the product, as much as the performance wasn't great, it wasn't much better, should I say? A lot of the little touches were really good. Head covers were good. Head covers were phenomenal. Yeah. The way you receive the the club in that was beautiful. But it felt different to any other brand. So I can understand why the price happened there. But then we get to well, 2022. So, so this now is, we've, we've <laughs> kind of set a bit of the backstory there and I hope for that make, has made sense to people. And also, if you're watching and listening and you, and you are a PXG fan or you've got things to say about PXG, pl- you know, feel free to comment down below in the comments. I know that myself and Rick will reply to loads when the video first comes live, so feel free to voice your opinion. But what's changed then? So where we're at now is PXG in a very strange place. So 
I'd say half of their brand still lives in this luxury market. So I'm on American Golf now, which is obviously one of the, the UK's golf retailers, and you can you can buy some PXG product on there. A lot of it's on sale, though, so I think that relationship may have ended. But, for example, you can buy a single golf ball marker, about the size of a 10 pence piece, for 18 quid. Now, that's very expensive. You can also buy a PXG tour bag for 589 quid. So, again, pretty expensive. You can buy a PXG valuables pouch, a little small thing where you put your teas in for 50 quid. So they're still producing products that are very expensive and potentially aspirational. You go onto their website as well, and I think they're trying to drive it a lot more to kind of direct to consumer purchasing that you buy it through them. They still make some product that is expensive. Now, maybe not as crazily expensive as it once was, but there's still definitely a market for those guys that want top stuff and, and don't mind paying for it. So, for example, I'm looking at a set of irons here now. If you go three iron down to pitching wedge, you're looking at 1,300 quid. So that sits like with your tailor maids, etc. The driver, their um, 0311 Gen 5 driver. So, is, by the way, that was the one thing, the name yeah, was the, always terrible. Yeah, they were confusing. The driver is £429. So, again, sits pretty much alongside your big names however it's not as much as it once was but where it does get very confusing the website in the uk anyway that's the only one i can comment on looks like a, a gimmick website it's just got sale everywhere and offers but then what's confusing as well and this is why people are starting to not understand the brand they also now sell a driver that retails at 229 quid and it's brand new now again people watching we all want golf clubs to be cheaper and if that's the way all the brands go brilliant but it starts to confuse people, doesn't it, as a marketing piece. Is PXG still this super exclusive brand that the guy in the Bentley is is using and buying? Or is it an affordable brand like a, a Ben Ross, for example, or a Lynx? Well, we was it a couple of years ago when I secretly bought a PXG driver? Yes. I felt like the price of that was about 300 odd I think it quid. was. can't remember. Fully. This is 100, again, 100 pounds. And 300 odd pounds for a PXG driver then was cheap. Yeah. Cheaper. Yeah, yeah. Again, use that term correctly. Um, we're now two hundred and twenty nine pound. Like, let's say you are that Bentley driver. You're a bit flashy. You bought these golf clubs for status that people do. You got your tour bag. Do you really want somebody coming over and say, oh, I've, "I've just bought one of those PSGs. Yeah. It's two hundred and twenty nine quid." I don't think you do, do you? Like, there's a reason why they don't make a, a ten grand Bentley car. Mm. Well, there? yeah, exactly. There's just not. If you buy a Bentley, you know there's. You've paid a price for that Bentley car or a Ferrari. They're not making a, an affordable Ferrari car, are they? No, it, it, there, there was something I heard that it was almost like an economies of scale thing. So they brought out some very expensive products to start with, a little bit like what Tesla did. And then the idea was then to get it kind of on a bigger scale and make it more appealing to a wider audience. But I think it's just in, in quite a quick five-year time to go from the driver being 800 quid, 1,000 quid, to now there's one that's 229 quid. It is quite a strange branding piece. What's still mad? Wedges, mm -hmm. Sugar Daddy Two, for a single wedge. Have you looked at this yet? I'm just looking. Oh wow, four hundred and twenty nine pound. That's the thing. It's so insane. How does that make sense? What are the putters looking like? Are There's they so many putters? They've done. They've got so. They're about three hundred quid. The first one yeah. clicks on, and they've yeah. got so many putters out. It I, seems like to me they've got this O two double one range as the cheapest yes. stuff from everything, haven't they? But then they've still got categories. I mean, some of the new irons look really good. Well, there's a set of irons I'm looking at now that are like kind of quite a chunkier set, um, and it says at three hundred twenty nine pounds per club. Now that's obviously very expensive. However, if you buy five or more, you save one hundred and ten pounds on each. So that, again, confuses me because it's like, well, it's okay. Well, it makes sense in some ways to have an expensive line and a cheaper line, but your expensive line, you're also now doing massive discounts on if you buy multiple irons, which obviously you're going to buy more than five irons. You're not going to only buy four irons for a set, are you? So it says here, if I went on this set of irons, they're called, um, what are they call? Bear with me. They've got weird names. 0311 XP Gen 5 irons, like a hollow-headed iron. If you wanted to buy those five iron down to gap wedge, it should be, because of 329 pounds a club, it should be 2,303 quid, which is dear. But you get a discount of 770 pounds, which then puts them down at 1,533. So still not cheap, obviously far from cheap, but a massive discount for no apparent reason. So are they struggling? Is that what it is? That they just want to get rid of stock? 
it is it is really weird because I'm on the bladed ones now. The PXG zero three one one. The names are so bad. PXG zero three one seven ST milled blades. Right, rolls off the tongue that doesn't it? Well, I think the names of the actual number isn't it from army Correct. numbers, which yeah. kind of I think that's quite cool. But then they've gone like extra bits after that, haven't they? Which makes it confusing. But but lines like this certainly just lose for me all credibility in a website like this. This is one of the reviews, okay? Built to demolish course records, <laughs> okay? And apparently that's from Plugged In Golf. I don't, I'm not sure who they are. Um, you've got like distance, like I mean, built to demolish course records. That's what um, people say about me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very strange. Like yeah. I said, I'd love to hear people's thoughts. I don't really know what what it is in my head, and I know this this goes against so much. Of what I say on a on a ninety percent of my time when I talk about golf equipment, it is too expensive. I honestly wish <laughs> it sounds ridiculous. This PXG had gone more expensive. Yeah, I said it. I don't know what that means, but it means they just sit in that in that space. It That's just, okay the, to be there. The, the reason for that is just that it helps you as a reviewer, as a golf fan, to understand where they sit as a brand. You know, we all know that TaylorMade, Callaway, Ping are premium golf clubs. You pay a whack for them. But you can get much cheaper brands actually perform pretty good as well. And it's quite simple. What PXG have done is come out super expensive, now got a line that's super cheap, but then still wedges that are super expensive. It is confusing. I've got one last point on this. Go on. I'm 100% saying that anybody that's bought a golf club, certainly a driver in the last five years, okay, mm -hmm. everyone listening, everyone watching, it's PXG's fault they've paid more. Because they start putting up the prices, and every brand from that ended up putting up the prices, yeah. didn't they? Yeah, like every TaylorMade went a bit more expensive, Ping went a bit more expensive, Callaway went a bit more expensive because you had up here PXG so expensive, mm. and then it flipped. So yeah. I honestly, I would blame everybody who's fifty. <laughs> I reckon you fifty quid out of pocket because of PXG, or you could sell your driver and buy the new PXG cheap one and be fifty quid back in pocket. You'd have to sell your third Bentley then, though. Ah, that's the issue. That was good. Considering we didn't have much to talk about, we've rambled there. So I hope that was a good episode. Um, let us know if it is. If it's not, also let us know. Email um, reviews at rickshields.com. If it's a, if it's a great, right, this is what we need to do from now on. Refunds at rickshields.com. Exactly. If you, if you think your podcast was good, then either like the video, leave a comment, uh, email us, leave a review on Apple or Spotify. I would love that. If you think it was good, please do that. If you think it was bad, then email refund at rickshields.com. But weirdly, that email address, you do spell your name the wrong way around. So it's yeah. S H E I L S on that one. And you put a D in. And you put a D, Rick Shields. So, uh, and we'll get back to you promptly. By the 4th of with July. A, with a full refund. Yeah. Or just don't say anything. Go on with your day and don't leave a negative review. So we'll see you at Break 75 on Friday. Um, You're not, not, seeing, <laughs> not seeing me again. I'm literally, I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I've still not even decided yet whether it's going to go out. Yeah, well, um, if not, if, if you decide it's not, what we could do, we could actually put it on the channel, unlisted, then people could pay a £100 fee to get the link to watch it. You can make a load of money off that. <laughs> you could be the first guy ever to shoot 105 and make money. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. All right, guys, thanks for watching and listening. Make sure you like and subscribe to the best golf YouTube channel and podcast in the world. <laughs> Period. Boom. <laughs>